collision alert blared through that gray fox, red lights flashing across the control panels. Captain Sam Walker's heart hammered in his chest as he lunged for the comms. Mayday! Mayday! This is the Gray Fox hauling critical supplies to Mars Colony. We are on a collision course with an unknown object, requesting immediate assistance and rescue. I repeat, this is the Gray Fox declaring an emergency, Static hissed in reply. The monitors flashed a five-minute countdown, five minutes until impact and almost certain destruction. Sam slammed a fist on the console. Of all the times for comms to go down, the ship's AI intoned calmly over the loudspeakers. Attention, collision imminent. Suit up and prepare for emergency evacuation. Sam's mind raced as he reached for his spacesuit with shaking hands. What the hell was out there and why hadn't scanners picked it up sooner? More importantly, would he make it to an escape pod in time? The fate of the crucial cargo, the colony, and his own life hung in the balance as the clock ticked down precious seconds. The opening aims to immediately thrust the reader into a tense, high-stakes scenario while leaving some mystery about the unknown object on a collision course. Sensory details convey Sam's panic and a sense of urgency as time runs out for him to evacuate. The dire consequences are hinted at by mentioning the critical nature of the ship's cargo for the Mars colony. This opening hook raises key questions to keep the reader engaged while setting up a dramatic opening scene. The spacesuit would provide, at most, a few hours of air. And if no transport ships came by, then he was a dead man. Since there were so many transport ships traveling along set paths in space, referred to as tracks by the UN, a chance encounter wasn't unexpected. The timing, however, would be a crucial element to his survival. He went to the air chamber and hit the switch. The egg-shaped plexiglass attached to the shuttle's wall slid open. He still had a few minutes. He would use them by God, and one last broadcast wouldn't hurt. He bolted back to the control board and grabbed the mic. Gray Fox to anyone. I'm in a hell of a bind here. I've got collision detection on my radar. Please, for the love of God, someone be here. No response came. He dropped the mic again and then wiped the sweat from his forehead. Using the steel side handles, he jumped up and into the suit. Meanwhile, the voice of the AI started a countdown from one minute. Tears fell from his eyes. He thought of everyone he left behind, back on Terra, his 80-year-old mom and dad living in the Daymont Care Center in East Michigan. Who'd take care of them now? His fiancée, Katie, has curly dark hair, smooth olive skin, and beautiful eyes. Leaving them all behind was bad enough, but after all these years of worrying about these trips he took and finally having something like this happen, it would give them confirmation of their fears, a fact he wasn't yet ready to face. His transport load car, which the shuttle had been carrying, had to be unlatched before he did anything else. The spacesuit had an AI of its own, and he ordered it to detach the cargo at once. Pushing the ejection button, he felt the helmet come down and seal shut. Oxygen began to flow into his lungs as he braced for the unknown. A cloud of steam then billowed from the floor vents as the door behind opened. Using the buttons on a virtual screen projected from his helmet, his suit accelerated him well above the Gray Fox and watched as the glow of orange illuminated for just a moment before fizzling out. Not a remnant remained of his ship. What a damn shame, he thought, a multi-million dollar headache for the Celestial Amos Corporation. It's not like he'd have to worry about explaining to any of those bastards what happened. The North American UN and World Bank branch would either bail them out or they wouldn't. It was as simple as that, and he had no reason to care. Regarding his death, his signed waiver would absolve Chelmos from any lawsuits or insurance payouts to his family. It was the downside of being a supply runner for them. It's not like he qualified for better paying work in Terra's 23rd century economy. Scanning the area of his suit's computer for the transport cargo, he could not locate it. Giving up on the cargo for now, he accelerated towards the next track, which was some distance away, but manageable. He searched through the database of tracks Selmos had loaded into his suit's computer, but when the nearest track appeared, its identity came up in large letters with the word encrypted. He stayed along a random track he came across and waited for nearly an hour and a half, but no ships came. Drifting in and out of consciousness, the AI of his spacesuit jolted him awake upon giving him a two-minute warning. The two minutes went by slowly, 
and the 10-second countdown began before searchlights shined into his space helmet. Above him, an airlock opened, and he climbed up from a ladder that had dropped down. A familiar scene of steam billowing from the floor vents obstructed his spacesuit's helmet right before he removed it. The suffocation had only started, but air flowed into his lungs, offering relief. A figure appeared from the other side of the clear airlock, though the steam had obscured their features. After the haze settled, the door opened, and he was pulled out of the chamber. Then he was thrust against this giant ship's hull as he winced in pain. When his eyes opened again, an attractive, slim young woman with long dark hair, wearing a shiny white, blue, and red lycra uniform, stood before him. He noticed the hammer and sickle emblem on her right breast, but by then the laser pistol she had trained on him made him put his hands in the air. A security officer of this ship, he realized it made sense considering her athletic build. This ship must have belonged to the Russian Union. She lowered the pistol and extended her hand. I'm Tasso. He accepted her handshake and said, Sam Walker. I work for Selmos Corp. She left the chamber area and into the lobby of the ship. Follow me. He followed her through the lobby and into a small room. Take a seat, she said, gesturing to a small chair at a table. She sat across from him. I'm the captain of the Kikimora. We're headed for the Russian colony on Mars. It's in the Sidonia region. I need to know where your ship was headed and for what purpose. He slumped in his seat and folded his hands. The Gray Fox was headed for the NIU colony on Phobos. I had a shipment attached to the shuttle, but it went missing. That's all there is to it. She slid a photo over to him. It was of a large hangar area with a sizable cigar-shaped container with the Sigma logo that belonged to Selmos and the ID sticker that matched the Gray Foxes. How and where did you find this? She leaned in closer to him. We have a tracker that detects the materials for spaceships and shipment containers like you were carrying. Wouldn't want these goods to go to waste. Certainly not, Sam said. The goods were all produced by the Autofact back on Terra. Tasso stood up. That's all? This is a formality we run through after picking anyone up. My assistant, Anna, has something for you to sign digitally. She'll show you to your quarters. The living quarters reminded him of the old East Michigan High Cafeteria he'd attended as a teen back on Terra. Several silver lunch tables and rooms lined up along the walls were in the middle. A stairwell past the lunch area led to a second floor with more rooms. He sat at one of the tables eating the breakfast they'd served, consisting of rubbery scrambled eggs, a cheese stick, an apple, and a stale slice of bread and water to drink. These quarters felt empty and lifeless until a tall, well-built man with olive skin and short black hair came out of the middle room. The man got his breakfast from the cafe line and then sat across from him. He took a mouthful of eggs and then extended his hand. I'm Curtis, class of century bot, an official space pimp of Russia's finest ladies wearing sexy spandex. What do they call you? Sam shook the man's hand. Sam Walker leader of, well, getting his space shuttle blown to shit and then miraculously rescued, I guess. Curtis chuckled. Oh yeah, your shuttle was hit too? Sam nodded. Strange shit. I got a message from God knows who, warning me just in time for me to escape. Curtis looked at him with stunned, wide eyes. Same thing here. My shuttle transport is sitting in this ship's hangar. Yours, I assume? Sam nodded once again. Haven't either of you read Douglas Adams? Sam's attention was drawn to a middle-aged man who stood beside the table where he sat. He held a lit cigarette, had grayish brown hair, and was about five feet tall. A spaceship goes bad, and one is right there to rescue the protagonist. And, Curtis said irritably, the man sat down beside them. Think about it. You both get a message from a stranger, and your ship gets destroyed, but not until you escape with your cargo. Sam gave the man saucer eyes. What are you getting at, dude? The man tapped on Sam's temple. Time to use that noggin of yours. Both of your shuttle's cargo is in the Kikimora's hangar. This Russian ship brought you on board after you were warned of danger. These things don't happen by accident. Curtis looked Sam in the eyes. They were following us both, and they're the ones who destroyed our ships. Bingo, the man said. Sam held his face in his hands momentarily, then removed them. To steal our cargo. 
Curtis swallowed his next mouthful hard. When you rule out every other possible explanation, this is the only one that makes sense. The man said nothing. Who might you be anyway, Sam asked. Elijah. What brings you here? Curtis asked. Same thing happened to you? The man shook his head and continued eating, not so much as laying an eye on Curtis or Sam. The two young men looked at each other and shook their heads in bewilderment. I'm just here on business for Chelmos like you guys, Elijah said after a few awkward minutes passed. I'm in the same boat as you two. After lunch, Curtis and Sam went to a recreation area where a few vintage arcade machines sat, games like Pong, Pac-Man, and Asteroids. Curtis went up to Pac-Man and pressed the start button. Sam watched him play, deciding against playing the other games himself. I hope we can see the rest of the ship soon. We can't. Both men turned around to find that Elijah had entered the rec room. Sorry to break it to you, but we're all being held prisoners in here. Curtis got in the man's face and shouted, Hey, this is an A-B conversation, so see your way out. Elijah appeared unaffected by Curtis's aggression, standing in place and blinking gently. He walked away without saying a word and made himself at home with the Space Invaders arcade machine. Curtis started towards the man, red-faced and hostile. Sam extended his arm to hold him back. Chill, Kurt. It's fine. He stepped back and sighed. Something about that man. He's so, uh, arrogant. He paused. A know-it-all-all, -all, if you ask me. Sam rested against the Pac-Man machine. Give him a chance. I don't know about that. You're just scared, Curtis. If they hand us over to the Russian authorities, we might never see our families again. Elijah's reminder that we might not obtain that goal is a threat. Curtis returned to the game and started to play again. I guess. The man turned, setting his hands inside his pockets. They've confiscated our cargo. You'd better believe they're keeping us prisoners on this ship. I imagine you both noticed Russia's insignia on Tasso and her assistant Anna's uniform. Elijah paused for a moment and strolled over to the two men. Curtis looked perturbed, but at least seemed fascinated by what the man had to say. Now, I can't prove my theory, so I'll tell you later. But just know this. We'll be grounded to our rooms tonight around 9 p.m., and the doors will lock behind us. The bed of Sam's room wasn't the most awful thing he had to sleep on, but certainly nothing to write home about. He took note of the missing items spaceship quarters typically had, like a shower, a complimentary toothbrush with toothpaste and soap, along with others like a TV and desk to work on a laptop or tablet. Observing the area outside his room, he judged it as bare and sterile, not unlike his days in the NA Air Force, where he learned how to fly. It could be a military ship, he thought. Then again, it could be a prison pod, as Elijah suggested. But there was only one way to check. He stood up and tried the door of his room. It wouldn't budge. He felt his blood run cold. His claustrophobia hadn't been an issue for many years, but his confinement had always been his own will. Now he didn't have control of it, making his stomach churn. With shaky hands, he pressed the help intercom, which he assumed reached Ana Ortasso. He asked for an explanation of the locked doors, but no one answered. They're all asleep, he realized as he took note of the time seen on the digital clock hanging on the wall. While after midnight, he still felt restless. He laid back down, closed his eyes, and breathed deeply until sleep came. An alarm over the intercom woke him up bright and early. Without hesitation, he joined his new friends at the lunch table for breakfast. The robot behind the cafeteria counter had served all three the same breakfast on a tray. Brand Flakes wasn't his favorite cereal, but this brand had an earthy taste. The apple had mildew and was brown in the middle. Of course, only water was available, as always. He greeted the two men and asked how their night was. Both had restless nights like his. Then they ate in silence. The first to say anything was Elijah. Has it set in yet? Curtis gave him an annoyed look. Has what set in? We've been locked up as prisoners of the Russian Union. Sam had finished for Elijah. Elijah nodded. Likely they've already contacted the Russian authorities back home. Listen, I thought long and hard about our situation last night. It must be something inside our cargo that got us into trouble. Forget what I said about them stealing our cargo? Curtis gave him saucer eyes. But all we have is food, water, and such, right? I mean, 
Everything was inspected before we left. Yeah, but we never get to see the cargo ourselves. What if someone within Selmos or the Martian colony is smuggling substances? Elijah said. God, I hope not. Russia's been ultra strict with its drug policies. They'd give you 10 years for just having a hemp vape, Sam said. Elijah nodded again. We have to find a way off this ship. They'll throw the book at us if we're caught selling or distributing illegal drugs. Curtis slammed his fist on the table. Damn it, I'm out of here. Go ahead, Elijah said as he disappeared into the bathroom. I'm sure each of our cargo units has been scanned with x-rays by now. Either way, we'll devise a plan later when another ship is in range. They must have a scanner we can use. Sam moves towards Elijah's ear. They might have this place bugged. Let's stop talking about this. Elijah nodded. By the way, Anna contacted me this morning when I got up. We're all to meet her at the front door of this pod by 0800 hours. Elijah stood up. Time to put on our prison clothes. Sam followed him to the front door, which Anna stood behind. She pressed a button on a panel, and on their side, a small compartment opened with three outfits. Here, all of you put these on. The clothes you have on need to be changed. I'll bring Curtis his, Sam said. Then the two of them took their uniforms and went to shower to change. The uniform was a dark blue t-shirt and sweatpants combo. At least they smell fresh like daisies, Elijah said before chuckling. They must be fans of Downey, even in Russia, Sam said. They both laughed. Where's Curtis? Elijah shrugged. Can't concern myself with whatever that prick is doing. I've got my ass to worry about and so do you. He should have been at the door with us to get his uniform, but I haven't seen him since breakfast. He's not in his cell, nor the rec room. Elijah put his hand on Sam's shoulder. I'm saying let him take care of himself. He paused and then continued to get dressed. I think the guy hates having women in authority over him. Well, if you want my opinion, male pride, Sam said. Then again, it could be Russians he has something against. Elijah made a quizzical face. They were the new allies' enemies during the last war. Them, China, and North Korea. I get that, but why take it out on us? Elijah left and headed to his quarters but turned around. Truthfully, I don't trust the man. So watch what you say to him, Sam nodded. He won't put on this uniform, I can tell you that. Not sure about trusting him yet. An announcement came over the loudspeaker, ordering the three of them to meet at the front door of the pod immediately. This time, Tasso and Anna met them with laser pistols drawn. Where's Curtis? Tasso asked. We have no idea, Sam said. He disappeared after breakfast, Elijah finished. He seemed agitated about something. We're not sure what. Both of you get to your rooms for now. The two men hustled to their rooms, and Sam heard his door latch locked behind him. Both women entered the pod area with laser pistols readied, searching the room cautiously. When all hope of finding the man was lost, a utility closet door opened from the shadows of the north corner of the pod. Curtis ran at Tasso, who had her back turned to him. Sam tapped furiously on his cell door window, pointing to the half-crazed man. Tasso turned quickly, but it was too late. He'd already hit her, sending her to the floor. Anna was his next target. He ran at her without noticing the laser pistol in her left hand. She fired once at his chest. Curtis tried to keep going, Mutiny determined but collapsed to the ground before he could reach her. Tasso hurried back up, where she and Anna began stomping on the man's head before grabbing him by the arm and hitting him in the face numerous times. Together, they dragged his beaten and stunned to his cell, his face well bruised and bloodied. Tasso hit a button from her smartwatch to unlock Sam and Elijah's doors. We must hurry out of here, she said. Follow us, Anna said. The two men joined both women and left the pod together. They all bolted down in a half-lit corridor, eventually stopping inside a small space shuttle hangar. Tasso led the two to a shuttle marked Lion's Mane. Get inside and strap yourselves in. What about Curtis? Sam asked. He looked hurt back there. He needs medical attention. Let him rot in that cell, Elijah interjected. Tasso strapped herself in. Get in now. This is an emergency. A robot from our med bay can help the bastard. I only stunned him. It's not like I had the heat up on this thing, Anna said, pointing to her laser pistol. Sam reluctantly joined the others inside the shuttle. 
Anna messed with some controls on a panel, and the engines behind them fired up. After a bit, they took off at an unimaginable mock speed into the blackness of space. Their destination appeared in less than 10 minutes as the ship's autopilot slowed to a crawl. A vast spaceship came into view through the right window of the line's main. Sam guessed it to be the size of a small city. It had two archways with a bridge connected in the middle, and beneath them, its base was puck-shaped with an aperture in the middle. The line's main drifted slowly to the center where gates opened, seemingly motion detected. Tasso got on the radio to reach someone on this giant city station. This is Tasso of the Kikimora. I'm on the line's main shuttle. Can anyone on board the Minerva respond? No response. After a few more times, she gave up. Their ship was swallowed into the formed hole and landed inside an empty hangar. The ship doors opened and the two women got out of the ship first with their laser pistols readied. Sam and Elijah followed close by, Anna signaling the two men to stay close. Tasso cupped her mouth. Is anyone here? This is Tasso from the Kikimora. I have a small group and we mean no harm. Her voice echoed over and over throughout the ominous hall without an answer. This must be a UN ship? Elijah asked. Anna nodded. Together, they searched the two football field-sized hangar without seeing any sign of life. They found an automatic gate about 12 feet high and wide. On the other side was the main entrance. Glass separated two rooms. One side was a metallic hallway and the other was in pitch darkness. Suddenly, the light on the other side switched on. The front desk and console appeared unmanned. What happened here? Sam asked. Tasso turned around. We have no idea. The distress signal and message came from an unknown source to the Kikimora's bridge. But it didn't come from the ship, Elijah asked. We don't know for sure, but it seems doubtful. I traced the signal and its origins are near Terra's moon. The group continued through the entrance, which had detected their presence and opened automatically. The front lobby had plenty of seating, a map of the ship hung from a stand in the middle, a coffee station, a TV running space span, and other amenities like restrooms. Still, no sign of life was here. Sam cleared his throat. So who's all on the Kikimora besides us? Tasso gestured towards the next area, but answered his question. We have 30 people in stasis, all colonist transports, but tech is awake in case anything goes wrong. Now let's get moving. I feel something terrible happened here. The men followed behind the women through the lobby exit. Sam spoke up. The place looks abandoned. Maybe they all left on life ships. Elijah shook his head. This station houses tens of thousands. They don't have quite that many life ships. The LED in the following area brightly displayed living quarters, section one. The hall was short, but open to a much larger rectangular courtyard area. Above them were many floors with rooms, not unlike a vast indoor hotel. Where do we go from here? Elijah asked. If we start looking every nook and cranny, we'll be here all day. As they were moving, Anna turned and stopped and put her hand on Elijah's chest. Both of you, shush, were following Tasso's lead. Tasso nodded. Okay, gentlemen, take a look around here. If you find anything, call me on this. She threw the two men's smartphones and gave her and Anna's contact information. They all split up, so Sam searched most of the floors, but no one had any sign of life. All the doors to the rooms had been locked anyway. Tasso walked through the main hall to the other side of the courtyard. Sam and all the others followed her. This main hall connected the living quarters area to the medical center. Tasso attempted to open it, but found it was locked. So she contacted the tech on board their ship to break the security. They were forced to wait nearly 20 minutes before the main door to the medical center unlocked. The state of the medical center was vastly different from anything else the group had seen on the Minerva. The halls of medical were gloomy as no light appeared to be working, only a few flickering lights here and there. All four switched on their smartphone's flashlights and first explored the left hallway. When they got to the end of the hallway, a streak of blood caught their attention. Anna halted both of the men with her hand. Stay here while we check out this room. The two women went ahead with their laser pistols drawn. When they reached the room doorway, Anna gasped. Tasso put her hand to her mouth in response to something. Both men joined them. Elijah covered his eyes while Sam froze in shock. A young man, about 22, was ripped in half at the torso with his intestines scattered below him. 
At first he remained still, but some movement occurred in his face. He made a groaning sound and raised his head a bit. Get out, he whispered with an agonizing tone. Claws. They. Those were his final words. His head plopped back down to the floor, and he didn't move after that. Claws, is that what he said? Sam asked. Elijah looked at him and nodded. They come from the artifact back on Terra, produced after the Terran tussle ended a few years back. They've been dormant among the various unions until the UN approves their use. They were programmed to assassinate Russian agents, but maybe that's changed. Tasso broke in. We don't have time for this. We should leave this ship now. Anna shook her head. What about the rest of the ship? We may be able to save a few here. Tasso started down the hall towards medical's entrance. We came here with the expectation that someone would be here to meet us. There are only a few of us and might be many more claws. We don't stand a chance. She's right, you know, Elijah broke in. We're better off getting back to the shuttle for now. We could circle here and keep on the radio to see if anyone responds. Anna sneered at him. Didn't I tell you to keep quiet? You aren't in charge here. Tasso and I are. He said nothing. However, he did roll his eyes. Anna got in his face. What? She nudged him. What's your problem? Tasso separated the two. Let's just go. Now. Tasso continued down the hall, and they followed until they got to the entrance. She approached the door, but it didn't open. Pressing the override button on the side did nothing. But an AI voice suddenly came over the loudspeaker. Danger detected. A lockdown has been initiated. Living quarters off limits. What do we do now? Sam asked. Just then, red floodlights flickered on. Tasso stared at the door, her face intense. This damn thing open now. She shot the door with her laser, but the steel door showed minor damage. A metal clanking sound echoed from down the opposite hall. They all turned. A shadow moved in front of the exit far beyond. Anna stepped forward. I'm going to check it out. Stay here. Anna, no! Tasso shouted. Anna ignored her. She strolled down the hall cautiously with her laser pistol readied. After some time, Tasso glared at the two men and then followed after the woman. Anna stopped in a middle opening where a lobby was. The metallic sound started again abruptly. Just then a claw jumped from the right side of the lobby and clung to Anna's leg. She screamed in agony and dropped her pistol as the claw dug into her thigh. Tasso bolted down the hall to help. Raising her pistol, she fired. Metallic particles, steel springs, and a relay box flung in the air into a cloud of dust. Sam ran down the hall and into the medical center lobby alongside Elijah to attend to Anna, who was on the ground favoring her massive wound. He shined the flashlight from his phone and noticed several bodies of UN police scattered about. Quickly, he took the top off one of them and wrapped it around Anna's wound. This will stop the bleeding, he said gently. Just relax, you'll be okay. Echoes of metallic clanging returned throughout the lobby. Look, Elijah said, pointing to the vents. More claws entered the room, and for a time they froze. The police have weapons, let's grab them. Meanwhile, Tasso walked backward and stood with her back against the wall. Sam went with Elijah to search a few of the own police. They found a few laser pistols with at least 30 shots left. The claws surrounded them. Sam was the first to fire at a claw on the ceiling above Tasso. You're not safe there either, he said. Elijah fired at several of them, but they came in droves from the vents. You'd better call your tech. We've got to get out of here, he told Tasso. She called him quickly and asked him to override the security lockdown. The three fired at the claws for a time, destroying many. For a short time, they'd even stopped coming. Tasso and Elijah ran to the aid of Anna. Together, they lifted her and helped her walk down the hall towards the entrance. Sam followed behind and heard her say under her breath, Come on, Silas, get this damn thing open. They waited by the door anxiously. They could hear the claws drawing in from both the east and west rafters, closer and closer. Suddenly, a vent burst open from the west hall, and they came running. The three fired, but they kept pouring in, two by two. The red light beside the door turned green, and finally, the door could be opened. Inside the lobby, they rushed through with their feet moving almost involuntarily. Run like hell, Tasso ordered, 
as they bolted down the courtyard of the living quarters with the claws chasing close behind. The ventilation system must be separate from medical, Elijah said. No shit, Anna said with gritted teeth. They reached the main lobby door in no time. Sam glanced at Anna and said, Hang in there. Her face grimaced in pain, but showed a bit more vigor than before. There was a manual lock for the main lobby door, and Tasso latched it as the two men helped Anna down the hall. Once inside the lobby, everything seemed calm again, and an eerie silence retook hold of the ship. Still, they hurried to the hangar door, which was now unlocked, but the lobby door behind them was sealed shut. Tasso was the first to enter the hangar, and the two men almost bumped into her when she froze in place. Look, she whispered in a desperate tone. Numerous claws occupied the opposite side of the room. Sam scanned the hangar carefully and saw a separate entrance to medical, which they'd all missed before. But it made sense since anyone getting off a ship who might be wounded could have easier access. Tasso ran towards the wall to their left, firing on the claws. They all watched as the metal parts exploded. Hurry to the ship, she shouted. They picked up the pace as much as they could. Tasso made as much noise as possible while opening the ship door with her smartphone. The claws were about 40 feet away. Not sure we're gonna make it, Sam said. Just go, you two, Anna said. Leave me behind. Sam shook his head. Hell no, no one gets left behind. Elijah lifted Anna by her leg and signaled Sam to do the same. Together, they continued running towards the ship with Anna in their arms. The claws were about 20 feet away on the opposite side. At least no humans will be left, Elijah said. This station's already gone to shit. There might be more survivors here, but our small group doesn't stand a chance against these things. When they reached the ship, the two men set Anna gently inside and hopped aboard, and immediately the door shut behind them. Tasso, Anna shouted with all the strength left in her. They felt a few claws jump on the roof of the ship. Sam could see Tasso shooting towards the top from the ship's window. Anna grabbed the mic attached to a few loudspeakers outside the ship. Tasso, we aren't leaving without you. Get in here now. She dropped the mic before crawling to the ship's captain's chair and opening the door. As soon as it started spreading, it closed again. The vessels displayed the words that made everyone's hearts sink, access denied. Anna slammed a fist on the control board but it was too late. The ship's autopilot had been activated and began to lift off the ground. Sam looked out the window and saw the claws filling the hangar, but Tasso was nowhere to be seen. Where is she? Sam said. It's too late, guys, Elijah muttered. And just like that, they were out of the station, traveling into the blackness of the cosmos. Anna slammed her fist on the dashboard again. Damn it, Tasso. Why didn't you get on the ship with us? With her hands in her face, she sobbed. Sam moved to the front seat beside her and rested his palm on her back. You two were close friends, weren't you? I'm so sorry, Anna. Anna raised her head from her hands and took control of the line's mains autopilot. It's not too late. She might still be alive. She turned the ship around and they headed back for the Minerva. Elijah leaned forward. Anna, please, you aren't thinking straight. We need to get help. Better weapons, at least. What you're doing is suicide. Anna didn't turn around but kept her eyes fixed ahead, her expression irritable. Don't tell me what to do. Remember, I'm in charge here, and you two are still in the custody of Roscosmos until further notice. Not a word from either of you. They moved in silence. Neither of the men opened their mouths. As the Minerva came into view, a dreadful feeling came over Sam but was interrupted by the lion's mane being jolted by a strong force. The sound alerted him. He glanced out of the front of the ship in terror at the sight. Anna put her hand over her mouth. No, she shouted. Sam's eyes grew huge from shock. The explosion came from the Minerva. They all looked for any sign of it, but all that remained was charred debris. He looked over to Anna who kept her eyes on the remains. They flew among the rubble for a time but it was clear that nothing was left to salvage. With a long face, Anna turned the ship around, and they returned to the Kikimora in silence. The two men led Anna to Medbay, where a Robodoc treated her wounds, followed by morphine to stop the pain. Once they got to the bridge of the Kikimora, Anna conversed with both of them as they sat beside her concerning their next course of action. 
Sam watched as she scanned every piece of cargo the two women had recovered. The touchscreen still indicated suspicious items, as read three-dimensional figures listed as unclassified weapons, but no specific information was available. Still, many things were shown as blue, such as food, water, clothing, and necessities for the Martian colony to survive. To both men, she said, we will continue to Mars before returning to Terra. I just wish we could contact home to report the incident we just experienced. We lost contact a few months back and Silas couldn't figure out why. Elijah gave her a curious look. I have a degree in electrical engineering from MIT. I could help Silas tether a connection to a Terran relay station. There must be one within 10,000 miles we could use. Go ahead, we have two open rooms you guys can use. As of now, you're no longer in our custody. You're both off the hook since I know the cargo came from the autofac. Elijah stood up and walked halfway out the door before turning and said, Once we can communicate with Terra, we'll get more info on this autofac this cargo came from. He then disappeared into the ship's hallway. Sam sat back with his arms resting behind his head. Is Curtis okay? Anna nodded. The Robodoc fixed him up, and he's being held in a solitary cell with no chance of escape. He'll face charges of insurrection of a Roscosma ship. You shouldn't worry about that scumbag anymore. He's finished. Sam stood and walked to the door to leave the bridge. Sounds like everything is in order. I'll let you get some rest. Let the AI of the ship take over for a while. I don't like Curtis anymore, but I was more concerned about his running loose on the ship. Silas and Elijah already agreed to take over for me after they contact Terra. Sam smiled and then left the bridge. Using a map posted in the ship's main hall, he found his new room from the number Anna had given him. Once he lay down, he looked at the time and was shocked to see that it was almost midnight. So much had happened today and he was worn out. He plopped down onto his bed, closed his eyes and slept. Someone shook him awake. Above him, a shadow of a female appeared. Tasso, is that you? He ordered the ship's AI to turn on the room's lights. Beside his bed stood Anna and she appeared to be distressed. It's me, she whispered. Elijah and Silas just contacted Tara and gave me some bad news. Sam sat up and rubbed his eyes. Is it about Tara? Shyly, Anna nodded. Nuclear war broke out since any of us left Terra. She paused and started to cry. Sam grabbed his forehead. We didn't? Anna nodded. I can't believe this. Someone finally did it. Is there anything left? Anna took a breath and regained her composure. The whole world is in ruins, Sam. Sam took a deep breath, covered his face and began to wail. You had to do it, didn't you? Those machines from the UN ship, Anna said, are all over the place on Terra. First, they were used by the UN against Russia, but then they turned on both sides and started killing people. Sam removed his hands from his face. So we're sitting on top of these things. Anna nodded. Not sure I feel safe now. These things are mixed up with our normal cargo, Sam said, which means we should get rid of everything. Or maybe not. I don't know. Damned if we do, damned if we don't. Elijah entered Sam's room. There are different types of these machines as well. Some can imitate humans. Sam shook his head in disbelief. What should we do, Anna? Elijah put his hand on Sam's shoulder but looked at both. Tasso must have destroyed that ship to get rid of all those claws. She used a bomb, that much we know. But where she got it and how remains a mystery. Anna teared up. Her sacrifice will be remembered. It won't be in vain. Sam nodded. Yes, it will. The AI voice of the Kikimora came over the intercom. Movement detected from inside the hangar. What the hell? Anna said. All three of them ran to the hangar. The figure was seen in the shadows behind one of the cargo units. Sam moved cautiously towards the crate, laser pistol in hand. Initially, he expected to see Curtis commit mutiny with his wounded leg, but it was someone else, a young woman with long dark hair. Tasso, is that you? He asked, but didn't get a response. He moved towards her, but Elijah stopped him. Yes, it's her. Tasso, how in the world? 
She stood up and faced all three of them with a smile. I know what I'm doing. Anna ran up and hugged her. Oh my God, I can't believe you made it off the Minerva alive. Impossible, Elijah said under his breath. Sam nodded to Elijah, then approached Tasso and shook her hand. Glad you made it. He looked back to Elijah, who'd already left the hangar. Likely he'd returned to his quarters, Sam realized. All three returned to the bridge where Tasso took control of the ship, at least in deciding where the AI would take them. From the corner of his eye, Sam noticed some movement on the security monitors, particularly the ones from below where all their cargo was held inside the hangar. From the containers, more Tassos could be seen moving about. Now he understood why it all had happened. He understood their leader's actions as well. All of these messages, the one to his ship and this one and the others, had come from one of these Tassos. He pulled Anna aside and asked her when Tasso came on board, and the woman admitted she'd only first seen her after coming out of stasis after the first six months. Together, they went to the stasis chamber to check on the others, only to discover all of them had been destroyed and the bodies inside killed. When the truth about Tasso finally sank in, Anna covered her mouth in horror. Sam put his arms around her and comforted her. The Martian and Phobos colonies are done for. But remember, Tasso was the one who destroyed the claws on the Minerva. When he told her this, she smiled, and so did he. Tasso may not be on the human side, but the self-replicating machines were already destroying themselves.